What a warm welcome. I'm exhausted listening to that introduction. Mm. Just remember that when you hit the age of 78, you must have done something with your life. So uh, it's, it's very much an appreciation that uh, some of these would be mentioned. I've looked forward, my wife Gail has looked forward to being with you this morning. Uh, when Pastor Felix suggested that we might try to do something like this, I prayed about it for six seconds and said, God says yes. So we're here. Many, many years ago when I was a very young pastor, it's a long time ago, my phone in my office rang one afternoon. It was my assistant who said, there's a woman out here who would like to see you for a few minutes. Do you, you have any time? And I said, yeah, we can make that work. And I went down and greeted her. She looked like a woman who was in her middle 30s, but her face showed all the marks of a long life that probably was terribly unhappy. We went back to the office where I did most of my work and sat down and after a moment or two of getting acquainted, I asked her what it was that we might talk about. And she said, well, <clears throat> I've been coming to your church for three or four months and I've been listening to you preach each week. She said, I've, I've only come because my brother dragged me here he was afraid that my life was going to end, and if I didn't hear something like this, there would be some real problems. She said, and I said, well, after being here for these months, what have you heard? She said, well, every week I hear something about what it means to, and she did this, she said, accept Jesus as my personal savior. I said, is that something that you're, you want to do? She said, yes, but I, I'm not sure that Jesus would want me. She said, and, and be, before I do this, I, I really need to tell you just a, a moment or two of my story because maybe you'll decide that Jesus doesn't want me either. Well, her story went very briefly like this. At the age of 16, she became become pregnant, and the boy that she was with in those days had walked out on her. Her parents had kicked her out of the home, leaving her on her own. She survived the next two or three years just by doing jobs after school. She ended up being a cocktail waitress in a, uh, a cocktail bar. At about the age of 19, she'd met a man who promised her some kind of safety and strength if she would come and live with him in his home. She and her small baby boy said yes. They had no other alternative as far as she could see. And for the next 13 or 14 years, she had lived with a man who did nothing much more than abuse her. He was a chronic gambler into heavy drinking. She got into drugs. She showed me the needle marks in her arm. She'd suffered from some severe depression, been in an institution twice. I mean, it just rolled out like that, moment after moment. And finally she came to the end and she said to me, so do you think Jesus would want a person like me? And you know, I wasn't so sure. I began to realize that nobody had ever trained me to talk to a person quite like this. And, and how confident can you be that a, a life might be marked and that it could change? And in that moment when she asks this question, would Jesus want a person like me? Your head is racing with everything you might know from the Bible that would provide an answer. And I remember that day that in that moment, my mind snapped to a particular chapter in the Gospel of Mark where this writer tells the story of three different people with very different backgrounds, but having some very similar streaks of experience each coming into the presence of Jesus, each asking the question, would Jesus want a person like me? And in that moment when this woman had raised this question in my office, that's where my mind went to these three people. And I began to wonder, in those three people, is there something that I can depend upon that I can tell her that gives her any kind of hope for a different future? that contrasts with the things that had happened in the past. The first of those three people back in the book of Mark was a man. 
He was a man who lived in a little village on the western side of the lake of uh, the eastern side of the Lake of Galilee. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of information about him, but it does tell us what condition he was in the day that Jesus met him. Apparently, as time had gone by, his life had become crazed with evil, with sinful power. I quite imagine, the writer doesn't say this, but it seems fair to me to say that when he'd been a young person, a lot of people wanted to have him around because he was the person that everybody laughed with. He was the life of the party. He was the person that got everybody stirred up, and so you made sure he was around if you wanted to have good times. But as time went by, his life began to change, to grow deeper and darker in ways that made people very uncomfortable with him. Until there came a moment where he crossed some kind of a line and, 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 and people just didn't want him around. They felt very uncomfortable. In fact, many felt, must have felt unsafe. And you can almost hear their conversations as they say to each other, what are we going to do with this person? We've never faced any person quite like this before. And the answer becomes, get him out of town. Chain him to some rocks. Train him to trees. Let him live in the graveyard. He doesn't belong here in this town where civilized people live. And so here they are, taking this man, apparently by force, out of the community, alone, in a graveyard, chained to stones and other things, no clothes, naked, screaming out outrageous things. You can imagine his children, maybe one afternoon, seeing him in this crazed condition. This is their father, and they can't come near him. You think about his wife going to bed at night and in the middle of the night hearing the shrieks and the screams of this man whose life is totally out of control. What does she think? What does she remember? What does she see as hope for the future? And this man himself, and one morning he meets Jesus on the shoreline. Jesus says to him, what's your name? My name is Legion for we are many. In other words, his life has exploded into small pieces. He's a shattered human being. And everything that human beings could have done for him has been tried, and nothing works. It's totally hopeless. And the question comes, does Jesus want a person like this? Does Jesus want a man like this around him? Won't he spoil Jesus' reputation? What will other people think? Can Jesus accept a person like this? It's a very important question for people like you and for people like me to think about from time to time. It's the kind of question that answers when we ask such questions about people around us and maybe at some point in our own lives, even ourselves. The Bible says that Jesus spoke into this man and he cast out the powers of evil the disease of sin, and suddenly what no one else could do, Jesus had accomplished. And there comes this moment when the townspeople hear that something powerful has happened in the life of this man, and they come out to see what's going on. They have no idea, and the story's a lot bigger than the way I'm telling it, but we will stick with this. Because the writer says this, and listen to these words if you've never heard them before. When the people came, they saw the man sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind. What an interesting description of a man who's been touched by Jesus. Sitting there, when for years he'd been running, screaming, shrieking, a danger to the people around him. Now he's sitting there. There's a peacefulness that has penetrated his heart. Sitting there clothed suggests to me a man who has refound his dignity, who can be in society unashamed, be accepted by other people, embraced by his children, hugged by his wife, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Suddenly he can think again. 
He can appreciate beauty. He can talk. He can listen. He can make decisions. He's ready to re-enter the generation of which he's a part. This is what Jesus did to a man that nobody else could help. And the answer to the question, does Jesus want a person like this, is yes. Because the power of Jesus is there to change this man's life and bring him into a new kind of humanity. That's the first of the three stories. And it's a powerful one. One of the great stories of the New Testament showing the kind of person Jesus presented himself to be when he saw folks in great hopelessness. Then there's a second story. You'll know this one. It's about a woman who's in a crowd. Jesus is in this crowd and everybody around him, including his disciples, are pressing him. And there's a woman in the middle of it, and the writer says of, of her this. She had a, a disease in her body, a disease of blood, of hemorrhaging. And no one could have anything to do with her. The law said when a person has this kind of a disease, they cannot be touched. They cannot go to the synagogue to worship on a week-by-week -week basis. They're weak, physically weak. They cannot work as normally they expected to do on other days. This is a woman whose life is completely on hold, a waste, it would seem. And the question comes, would Jesus have anything to do with her? The writer says for 12 years, this woman had been going out to various cities and towns around her, seeking out doctors she thought might help her. And she'd spent every bit of money she had seeking a healing, and nobody could do a thing. You see the continuity in these stories? In the first story about the man, the town can only kick him out of their sight. In the second place, there's no doctor that can help her. The hopelessness of this woman's life is just amazing. And the Bible says that she came into this crowd and when she thought no one was quite aware of her presence, she reached out and touched the very bottom of the clothing that Jesus was wearing. Why would she do this? Because the law said, first of all, that she was not allowed to touch or be touched by a man. The Bible says that she must live in total isolation. So this touching is the best and the only thing she can do. If I touch the hem of his garment, she says, I may be healed. And she does it. And immediately, the writer says, she's healed. I think about this woman who, for those 12 years, had, a, had gone to every doctor she'd known, spent every dime she had, how many times her hope must have been elevated as she made her way, let's put it in our world, a doctor in Los Angeles, a doctor in Seattle, a, a doctor in Salt Lake, a doctor in Kansas City, a doctor in Chicago, and every time she goes, this is the time when it will really work. I'll spend my last dollars on this doctor, and nothing has come but disappointment. And now she touches the bottom of the clothing of Jesus, just a touch. There's no money involved here just a touch. And Jesus says in that moment, the Bible says he stops. Now remember, he's in the middle of a huge crowd of people. They're all pressing around him. And he says, who touched me? And one of the disciples says to him, and now I'm, I'm just kind of building the story. The disciple says, who touched you? Are you serious? Hundreds of people are touching you. Why would you ask such a silly question? And Jesus says, all I know is that someone has touched me because I have felt power going out of me. Wow. You know, a lot of people can come to a religious gathering, even like this one, and we can sing and we can pray and leave the same way we came. And we've not touched or been touched. But every once in a while, there is someone in a gathering that gets touched, really touched. And Jesus' power enters their lives. And what no one else, no other doctor could do in this case, brings this woman to healing and wholeness. 
who touched me? This woman finally says, afraid of what's likely to happen, I was the one who touched you. And listen to the words of Jesus. Let me contrast them with the words of the first story. They saw him sitting there, clothed in his right mind. Now Jesus says of this woman, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go your way to your home. Go in peace. And you think of what must have surged through the mind of this woman whose name we don't even know. I can go home. I can hug my husband. I can do the work that's my responsibility. I can have friends again. I can go to market. I can go to the well. My life has been touched. Can Jesus help this person? Yes. Yes, he can. Which leads us to a third story. You've got a man that's kicked out of his town, a woman whose life has descended into wastedness, but then there's this little short story about a little girl. Her father finds Jesus. He says, my, my little girl is sick, she's dying. Come to our house, maybe you can do something. You see, his faith is there, it's limited, and you get the impression that as long as the little girl is still alive, he thinks that Jesus' power might change the situation. And Jesus starts toward the house, and while they're on their way, the word comes, don't bother the master any longer. The girl is dead. And when the Lord gets to the house, because he keeps on going, when he gets there, the sound and the sights, the people who are paid to grieve and wail and cry out loud and to make a, a big, big presentation of, of sadness, they're all there. They're into motion. They're looking forward to their pay because the girl is dead and they're doing the things you do around a dead person. And Jesus says to them, why are you crying? This child is not dead. She's just sleeping. And the writer says, and they all laughed at him. See, the crowd with the man kicked him out of town. The people with the woman simply said, don't come near. The crowd around the dead child said, she's dead. And they laugh at the futility of what Jesus has said. Can Jesus enter a situation like this and make a difference? The writer says he went up to the room where the little girl lay in her bed. He said to her daughter, arise. And it's like she wakes herself up from a nap and she gets up. She gets up. And you know, here, here's the thing that tickles me about this little short story. The man went home to his family. The woman went home to her work. But when this little girl comes back to life, Jesus says to her parents, she needs something to eat. Apparently dying makes you hungry. And my own thought is that he's suggesting something like chocolate chip cookies and cold milk. And she's back to life again. What do these three stories have in common? Hopelessness, power, the futility of a world system that so often does nothing for a person in need. And into this comes the Son of God, who has time for a man like this, who has time for a woman like that, who has time for a child like this. And the power of Jesus changes things, changes people. Something is new. Do you wonder why when I'm sitting in my office and this woman says to me, does Jesus want a person like me in his presence? No wonder these three stories can give the mind and the heart the courage to say, yes, yes, he does want you. Yes, he does want to walk in your life. 
Now, here's the end of the story. As this woman and I sit in our office, and my mind is quickly, I suppose you would say, gathered a little bit of courage and a little bit of strength, that maybe there's something for this woman that's not so hopeless. And I say to her, and remember, I'm just coming off the top of my head to extend. I'm a young pastor. I've never heard a story like this. I don't deal with people quite like this at that early stage in my life. So I'm, I'm flying off the top of my head, doing only what I've gotten out of that little chapter and doing what I think Jesus would want me to do. And I say to her, I think the first thing we do is that we're going to kneel together here in this room. And I want you in your own words to tell Jesus what you're thinking and what your questions are. And I suggest to you that you invite him to take over your life like he took over the lives of the people in that chapter. She said, I can do that. And she went to her knees. And I listened as she prayed. Maybe it was one of the first prayers she ever pay prayed in her life. I don't know. But the words were rough enough for me to realize this is not a person who has a lot of experience talking to heaven. But she does ask Jesus in. And when she's through, I make a few suggestions as to what she might do in the next days. And there are two things particularly I say to her. I'd like you to sit down every week for a while with my wife, Gail. She can help you put this thing back together again. The second thing I'd like for you to do, even though some people might not agree with me, I want you to go home. And I want you to be a wife to this man, even though he's not much of a husband to you. I, I want you to try to allow your life to be a sprinkler of the love of Christ in every way you can. And so she goes on her way. And each Sunday she comes to worship. Each week she returns to visit with Gail. Many, many times her conversations with Gail are full of tears, sobs, because this man at home is not buying this thing with Jesus. If anything, he's making life more cruel, more miserable for her. And every time she makes any kind of mistake or says the wrong thing, he will say to her, is that what Jesus gets you to do? And so she puts up with all of this abuse, week after week after week. How long can this go on? Then comes Easter Sunday. I'm up in front of the congregation in one of the Easter services, and I notice one of the back doors of the sanctuary open, and then she walks accompanied with a man. And I know immediately, this must be the husband I have never met. The husband who abuses. The husband who's violent. And he's there. And he goes through the service and listens to the music, listens to the preaching. And when the service is over, I decide to race up to the door I know they will have to go out of. And when they come through the door and I'm standing there, this woman introduces me to her husband. I say to him, I've heard a lot about you. He says, I've heard a lot about you. I said, could I suggest that we have lunch together? I'll pay the bill. You name the day and the place and I'll be there. He thinks for a moment and he says, meet me at Charlie's Eating and Drinking Saloon on Wednesday at noontime. Now I'm a pastor. I live by preaching the Bible. I don't go to Charlie's Eating and Drinking Saloon unless, unless you really want to reach out to someone who really needs Jesus. So on Wednesday I go, and when I get to the table, there he is, and he's already on his second martini. And I'm thinking to myself, how will the church treasurer pay this bill when he finds out that the pastor's taking people out for martinis? We begin to talk. And you know, <laughs> I've often thought about this. 
Those martinis were a blessed thing because they loosened up his tongue and he started telling me things that he probably didn't want to tell me. He began to talk about a broken childhood, about a violent home, of being surrounded by people who drank and gambled, took drugs. And when he got through telling him his story that day, I said to him, you know, I think Jesus could enter your life the same way he entered into the life of your wife. I'd like you to think about that. Let's get together again. And so for the next many weeks, at least once every eight or 10 days, we would sit down someplace and have a lunch or a breakfast, and we would talk more about this Jesus that I was so sure could enter his life. And one day he said to me, you know, I think I'm ready to make this happen. And that day, he called upon Jesus, the Son of God, the one to whom you were singing just a while ago, to enter his life. And in the coming weeks, as we met again and again, what a privilege to see the love of Jesus just penetrating deeper and deeper into this life that had been so dark and so violent. Then one day, he said to me, and this was the kicker, he said, I've been thinking and praying. And you know what? I think, and he mentioned his wife's name, which I'm leaving out. I think she and I ought to get married, don't you? I said to him, that's a wonderful idea. Whatever made you think of that? Well, I just think Jesus would like for us to be married. He said, why don't you and Gail come to our house a week from Friday? We'll invite our friends and you can get up in front of our fireplace and you can marry us in front of all of our friends. Well, that was going to be interesting. And so the day came. Gail and I walked up to the door of this house not having any idea what we were expecting. Finally, the door opens up and there's a man with a bottle in his hand that I'd never seen. It was a BYOB party, apparently. And the first thing he said when we identified ourselves is, well, we've all been waiting to see the people who could convince these two to get hitched. That's a good way to start a wedding. So we went in and met these 30, 35 friends, all who already had a little bit too much to drink. People who had no idea what the interior of a church looked like people who had never heard anybody name the name of Jesus before. And the moment came when the couple stood up and I took my Bible and stood before them. And that day, I, I in the beginning of the, the marital presentation, I said a lot about the Jesus who comes to save and change people. The Jesus who comes when you invite him into your life and freely is welcomed into a life and who allows lives to change. The Jesus that perhaps some of you in this room need to think about too, who can come into your life in your most hopeless moments, and he will not turn away. And this crowd watched that day as this couple, with a brilliance of joy on their faces, embraced and took each other as husband and wife. And you know the interesting end to that story was that the next Sunday morning, when one of our worship services opened up, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 or 15 of those people who'd been at that wedding were off in the second or third row. Something had happened to their friends in that wedding ceremony that penetrated their hearts and they said, in my hopelessness, I need this Jesus too. The couple I've told you about remained in our church for a few years. Little bit by little, they got more involved. They made a bevy of Christian friends. They served in various forms of the ministry of the church. And then they moved to another part of this country. And, you know, after a while, you lose touch with each other. But in the few times we've heard in the past about how they were doing, it sounded like life was going on between people who'd been touched by the power of Jesus. That's really all I can say of any sensibility this morning, except to bring this to a conclusion by saying, 
Is there anybody in this room who thinks and experiences like the three people I told you about? Or the couple who came to faith and came to one another? Are you here this morning and are you needing some special touch that Jesus has uniquely for you? Don't walk out the door of this place until you've settled that question. And I can affirm for you that if it gets settled and Jesus is in your life, something beautiful is going to happen. Let's pray. Thank you for the Bible, Lord. Thank you for the stories that we can read in it that give us hope and order to life. Thank you most of all for Jesus, who's at the center of it all, who looks away from no one, who never is not aware when someone reaches out to touch and to be touched. And my prayer, Lord, in this moment is for any person in this room, young, old, male or female, who has come here this morning with the feelings of hopelessness and needs to be touched by heaven. I pray in the final moments of this worship service that Jesus might do a mighty work. That's my prayer. In his name, amen.